your body to fight any foreign agent. Plants are helpful for the ecosystem. It's an electronic device for storing and processing data. The nervous system is all the collection of nerves in your body. Yeast is a eukaryote. Welcome to Spectacular Science, where it's all about science, with your host, Hey listeners, welcome back to this episode of Spectacular Science. I'm your host, Akshay. Have you ever wondered why there's so many breeds of dogs? Or why there's so many vegetables and fruits and different varieties of them? Well, I'm here at the animal shelter today, and I'm going to meet with Dr. Ian Dworkin to talk to him about artificial selection or selective breeding. Here at the dog shelter, there are so many different breeds of dogs. And they're all created by selective breeding or artificial selection. In this episode, I want to be speaking with Dr. Ian Dworkin from McMaster University in Canada about artificial selection and how it works. I want to go meet him at his fruit fly lab. You'll find out why it's called the fruit fly lab later. Let's go! Oh, I think I see Dr. Dworkin over there working with some fruit flies. Let me go say hi. Hi, Dr. Dworkin. Hi, actually. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks very much. And thank you for having me. Yep. I'm so glad you could join me today because I went to the animal shelter before and I saw so many breeds of dogs. I couldn't even count. And I wanted to talk to you about artificial selection and find out more about how all these dog breeds are made and a lot more about this amazing technology. And I should say technology, or should I say technique? Technique is probably the right word. And and in many ways, it's a technique that predates modern science, as we'll talk about. Yeah, it's so cool to think about. And I'm so excited to be in your fruit fly lab. And we'll get to that a little bit later. So first of all, can you please introduce yourself to listeners? Of course. Um, Again, my name is uh, Dr. Ian Dworkin. I'm a professor in the Department of Biology at McMaster University in Canada. And uh, I study evolutionary genetics, which means I combine the study of evolutionary biology and genetics and use modern techniques like genomics to answer questions in evolutionary biology, but also in genetics. And sometimes that means trying to find the genes or, or types of genes or variable types of genes in the genomes. And sometimes we use that to understand broad evolutionary mechanisms. Wow, that's really interesting. So how did you get interested in science? So my story is different than than a lot of the people I know. So I actually, when I was ending high school, I really wanted to be a jazz musician. And that's what I thought I was going to be. But I was really lucky. My brother, on my 19th birthday, bought me these two books that were about physics, but not for physicists, for just for anybody. And he basically said, hey, Ian, I think you'd really, really like science and you've never really given it a shot. And so I read those over the summer. Instead of going to university like I had planned, uh, I decided to go back to high school to take all my science courses. And then I went into science for university. And it took me a couple of years in university to figure out exactly what kind of science I wanted to do. But once I discovered evolutionary biology and genetics, I was hooked and have been hooked for, for basically 30 years now. Wow, that's awesome. From a jazz musician to a scientist. Yeah, there's actually many, many scientists who do, who like music as well. So it's a there's a big club, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. So back to your fruit fly lab. So that's a little hint to this question. What do you do in your lab? Well, right. So many, much of the work that we do uses what's called the fruit fly, although it actually doesn't eat ripe fruit. It's actually sometimes called the vinegar fly, or pomace fly, and pomace is the mushed up old apples at an apple orchard that you sometimes see because they like being over to those sort of stinky piles because they don't actually eat the fruit. They eat the the microorganisms on the fruit. Um, But we use fruit flies in the lab to both study genes and and people have been using them for over a hundred years to do genetics Um, but we also use them to understand questions about evolution and use artificial selection or selective breeding to change aspects of the way the flies can behave or how they look so we use a lot of we use the fruit fly wings a lot and the size and the shape of the uh, wings but we also look at their behavior and and say how they interact with one another and use selection experiments to do that 
Wow, that's awesome. Fruit flies in science. I'm already hooked. So now on to artificial selection or selective breeding. What exactly is artificial selection or selective breeding? So actually, I wonder if you've ever noticed you know, some families, everybody's really tall and some families, everybody's very short. And you might wonder, well, these two tall parents had, generally speaking, taller than average kids. And these two shorter parents maybe had on average shorter than average kids. And what happens if two really tall people have kids together, right? Are their kids also going to be tall? Well, selective breeding is kind of using the same things we kind of understand that relatives tend to resemble each other in, in characteristics. Um, and selective breeding is about taking characteristics that either biologists care about or animal and plant breeders care about. So in many cases, it's taking, say, chickens that maybe have larger muscles that will want to eat and breeding other chickens to do that or uh, selecting for taller plants or plants that grow faster. Um, and so selective breeding is really about taking individuals that have these shared characteristics, finding out if they have a genetic basis, and then often doing certain kinds of breeding experiments together to produce individuals uh, in the next generation or many generations later that have bigger versions of those characteristics or smaller versions of those characteristics. Wow, it's kind of taking two desired traits, putting them together and get this desired output. That's exactly right. So you're doing that. And sometimes it can happen really quickly. And sometimes it takes a really, really long time. Wow. How long are you talking about this? Well, that's a great question. So the longest running experiment in biology, which was started in 1896, is actually a selective breeding experiment. It's oh, an wow. exper yeah, it's an experiment that was done in corn in, at the University of Illinois. Um, and it was started in 1896 by Cyril mm -hmm. Hopkins. And mm -hmm. what this uh, scientist was trying to do was to produce corn that had higher protein or higher oil content, which is, of course, so important for the corn that we eat and that's used for animal feed and things like that. And that experiment has now been going since 1896 for over 100 generations. So for really, really long periods of time um, in our own lab, we can't do it for 100 years, but we because fruit flies breed very quickly, we can do it for 100 generations. And in fact, in our lab, we often do experiments which maybe are 20 generations. So that'd be like your great, 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 great grandkids of fruit flies. But we can do that in about a year. Uh, and we're lucky enough that we work with other scientists who've been doing these kinds of experiments for like 20 years. So I can't even do that many grades. But a fruit fly <laughs> that you get 20 generations in a year. So it's 400 or more generations of, of artificial selection. Wow, that's so cool. Those fruit flies must have a lot of grandkids. It's probably hard to keep track of it. That's actually one of the other reasons we like working with them is they they can produce lots of kids and lots of grandkids. And so it makes it easy to work with in the lab and they don't take up very much space so people don't get very annoyed unless when the the bottles open up and then everybody has flies in in the building <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen <laughs> not too often <laughs> so how does artificial selection work well if you uh know maybe a little bit about genetics is that Inside of us, we have our genomes and our genomes in, in, say, humans, we have two copies of each gene inherited from our mom and our dad. Um, and those copies of the gene we sometimes call alleles. They're, they're, and alleles can have different characteristics. So even though they encode maybe for making the same protein or the same uh, gene, sometimes they may do it a little bit differently. And that influences the characteristics, like how big a fruit fly wing is or how, for, for say, the kernel of corn, how much oil is in that corn. And selective breeding basically works by combining those characteristics and making individuals who have more copies of the alleles. Now, of course, at any one gene, an individual only has two copies, but it turns out it's not just one gene that influences, say, the fruit fly wing shape or how much oil is in a corn, but maybe hundreds of genes. And so the idea is over many generations, you get in these genomes, many different genes and the alleles that will all increase the oil production of the corn or will all make the fruit fly wing bigger. And after many generations, those individuals will get much, much, much bigger. Um, and now in modern animal and plant breeding, we use what's called marker assisted breeding. So it means that in addition to just looking at the characteristics, we actually know a lot about the genes involved now. And so we can use molecular markers. So basically DNA markers to help us and assist in how we do our breeding. 
Wow, that's so cool. It must be really hard to keep track of those hundreds of genes. How do you do that? That's that's a really good question. Well, we're we're really lucky just like we get to talk over Zoom with these great powerful computers. We get to use these same great powerful computers to analyze genomes. So we we go in and we sequence all of their DNA and then we can use uh, computer programs and fast computers to identify um, the variation in those genes and use techniques to try to identify which ones might be contributing. And once we know something about them, then we can then we can use those to help with breeding. Wow, that's so cool. So what role does artificial selection play in our everyday lives? Does it impact our foods or the animals in our lives? So that's a, a great question. And, and the way you started off looking at the, the animal shelter is one of, of course, uh, especially here in North America, one of our favorite examples, because I, I don't know if you have a dog, but we have a little puppy. And so many people, you know, love their cats and dogs. Well, even before we knew about genes and selective breedings, uh, people who were thinking about animal and plant breeding already had an inkling about these well relatives look alike and started selective breeding for characteristics, whether it was to make dogs uh, with certain hair colors or short noses or curly hair or whatever it was. Um, and of course, perhaps more importantly, plants that we eat. So for instance, if you saw the ancestor to modern corn, what's called teosinte, mm -hmm. you'd go, this is related to corn. It doesn't look anything like <laughs> corn. That you wouldn't be able to, to, to recognize it at all. <laughs> but after hundreds and hundreds of generations of selection, we get our modern big corn on the cob sort of thing. So even before we had modern science and modern genetics, people were already doing animal and plant breeding. Now we get to do this in, in essentially more efficient ways. We understand the mechanisms a lot better and we can do it much more efficiently. And whether it's selecting for cattle that can survive um, from diseases or plants that can survive in drought or in climate change um, or produce, you know, like we talked about before, corn with more oil or more protein, artificial selection is kind of all around us. Even if we don't, we don't uh, see it in our day-to-day -day lives, all of the animals and plants that we interact with on a daily basis, um, what we sometimes call animal and plant domestic domestication is usually a product of this selective breeding. Wow, that's so cool. So all of these fruits and vegetables that I eat every day, like watermelons, bananas, and even corn, which is so good on the barbecue, let me tell you that. It all came from these ancient, maybe even uh, ancestors that came over 100 million years ago that looks completely different from all of these it's so cold it's so cool to think about it yeah it is and it's not even that that ancient it doesn't have to be hundreds of millions of years really? um, many of these many of these things are only hundred the the difference between the the what we think of as our modern breeds uh for these animals and plants and the ancestors can often only be a few hundred or a few thousand few thousand years old um uh, so one of the great examples is um do you ever eat cabbage yep a lot do you, do you like cauliflower or broccoli? Uh, not broccoli so much. It's a little bitter, but yeah, I have it in salads and everything. It's awesome. And and do you ever eat kale? A little bit. It's really bitter. So. Well, those are yep. all from basically the same plant, what's called wow. brassica. And all of these have been artificial select, artificially selected really in the last few hundred or thousand years for different characteristics. Some for being making the big cauliflower and broccoli like florets, some for having uh, big leaves like kale. Um, and so selection can, can uh, be selected on very, very different aspects of it. And much of that's happened quite recently. Um, so it's, it's often more in the order of, of hundreds or thousands of years, not like so much of other evolutionary where it's over courses of millions of years. Wow. So you're saying that cauliflower and broccoli are cousins? They're very close cousins. That's right. Wow. That is so cool to think about. It's so cool. All these things that we eat come from this one plant. And it's just amazing how humans have figured out how to artificially select these. It's just amazing to think about it. Yeah, it's it's one of the things that keeps me so excited about what I do is seeing seeing that those impacts and and understanding how much variation there is and 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 in many ways how useful it can be and how potentially important it'll be as we we face climate change of maybe using these selective breeding techniques to make sure that we still have food for all of the people on the planet. Wow, that is awesome. So what advice do you have for kids who are interested in science? So that's great. I think first is doing like what you're doing is really engage scientists. Um, 
especially now with email and everything, they like they like talking to you about science. So if there's something you're interested, contact people and find out about it. Find out if you can come and, and do a tour. But most importantly, what it what it means to be a scientist is mostly about thinking about thinking about how do you look at questions and think carefully and skeptically about things and figure out appropriate ways to to answer those questions. Um, but you let your curiosity really guide you. What makes a scientist a good scientist is often being very, very curious and sometimes having really crazy ideas, but then being very skeptical about those ideas and thinking about how do I really test those? So, I mean, in addition to reading books, you know, really, what is it that makes you excited and curious, whether it's animals and plants or whether it's looking at rocks or is it trying to understand gravity or seeing um, rock, you know, thinking about what NASA is doing? All of those things can help lead you to it. But that excitement is the most important thing. And all of the other skills you can develop along with the excitement. Wow, that is some great advice. Everyone has that science excitement inside of them. They just need to find a way to unleash it. That is awesome. And uh, and uh, I think that, uh, like, just speaking from my own experience, is, is sometimes it, all it takes is having somebody around you who who really gives you support. And everybody, like you said, everybody has that scientist in them, and everybody has the abilities to to, to be a scientist. And I know that there's some people out there who worry, oh, maybe my math skills aren't going to be good enough, or this or that. But you can learn all of those things. You don't have to to worry about it. Even if you're a little bit slower or faster to learn them, that's not what matters. It's the curiosity and being able to approach questions with an open mind, and then also coming back and saying, how do, how can I be skeptical about how I answer these things? And that's really the most important skills. That is so amazing. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed it, and I learned so much about artificial selection. And I'm looking for a new dog, so this is really useful. I know there are hundreds of breeds to choose from. So thank you so much again for joining me. Actually, it was really my pleasure. Thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. Now back to the animal shelter. Oh, it's going to take forever to sort through these hundreds of thousands of dog breeds. Well, could you help me with that? I'll do my best. All right, let's go. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Spectacular Science. Spectacular Science is produced and hosted by me, Akshay J. Raman. Our theme song is by Charan Ramachandran. Thank you so much, Dr. Dworkin, for doing this interview with me. I really enjoyed it. And special thanks to Dr. Will Ratcliffe for arranging this interview with Dr. Dworkin for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Dworkin and Dr. Ratcliffe. Visit SpectacularSci.com to find interactive activities, articles, and blog posts. You can also find all of our episodes and ways to subscribe to this podcast. That's SpectacularSCI.com. Please subscribe wherever you're listening right now. It really encourages me and you'll get all the episodes automatically. Thank you so much for all your support. Thanks for listening to this episode and we'll see you on the next episode of Spectacular Science. Keep thinking about science. <laughs>